Hey guys, welcome to the Dr. Tina show. On this episode, I'm going to be doing a part two, all about GLP-1 agonists, better known by you guys as Ozempic, Wegovi, Monjoro. These are all a class of peptides that are being utilized in the pharmaceutical industry for type two diabetes and for weight loss. I did a part one, which was very well received. I had more downloads on that episode than any other episode I've ever done and more interest in that than any other episode or topic I've talked about. And it's been really, really well received. If you guys have not listened to that yet, I'm going to link it below. Please go listen to it. I think that that will clear up a lot of the misinformation that's out there. I think that these peptides are being really vilified. And I talk about that more in length in the other episode. I think there might be something going on here because there's one pharmaceutical company that owns the patents on these drugs that I mentioned. And what I'm going to share with you today is a study called Novel Insights into the Roles and Mechanisms of GLP-1 Receptor Agonists Against Age-Related Diseases. And we're going to go through this. I wholeheartedly at this point believe that the use of these peptides could essentially eradicate the need for most other pharmaceuticals. And that's a bold statement, I realize, and a big claim. But when this all started and I started seeing questions in my DMs, questions in my inbox, my podcast producer started asking me about Ozempic, 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 Ozempic face, what's going on? All of these, you know, all of the terrible side effects started coming out vilification of this peptide started happening on a massive scale. And then I saw the functional medicine community jump in and quite honestly, not to dog anybody there, but a lot of people who can't prescribe, who don't have license to prescribe, were saying all kinds of mad shit about it basically. And I'm sorry, I've got a little puppy in the background. He's making a ruckus. That should be his name is ruckus. Anyway, I thought, well, You know, anytime the entire world seems to come down upon something, my brain veers left. That's just how I'm built. Whenever I see a group of people running in one direction, I start to scrutinize and I'm like, what's going on here? And I go left. My research brain turns on. And I did the same thing with this. And I've got to tell you, I've been completely blown away with what I found. This is a you could call it a meta-analysis, this paper here. This was published in, uh, I got to put my readers on, I can't see. If I have glare on my glasses, I apologize. This was published in April of 2022 in Aging and Disease. And there are over, gosh, I don't know, 174 references on this paper. These peptides that people are vilifying are very well studied. Bottom line, they're very well studied. They are very well studied and they are being vilified on a scale I can't believe. The studies go way, way back to the mid 2000s. And these have been used for a long time. And since I launched that podcast episode last week, I've heard from a lot of doctors using this in their practices with remarkable results. And I've gotten even more messages, emails, DMs from people who have been using it, telling me crazy stories of complete reversal of conditions. You just wouldn't believe one lady's congestive heart failure reversed. And they are being so shamed by their family members that they're now, some of them are lying to their family, telling them they quit taking them because the vilification campaign, the propaganda that campaign that came down upon these peptides and the mainstream media on social media are so intense that people actually think a There's a shortage, which there's not. I talked about it on my last episode. There's a shortage of the pen injectors. There's no shortage of the actual substrate, the peptide. And you can get it compounded for a very reasonable price. So the whole, it's too expensive is blown out of the water. So they're not terribly ridiculously priced. And I go through the different types of them on the other episode. You can listen there. The other thing is the black box warning literally cracks me up. We have no black box warning on the current intervention that's being pumped out annually at this point, but we have a black box warning on these peptides because in some rats, there was some medullary cell carcinoma in their thyroid In rats, no human cases, but it gets a black box warning. Do you know how hard it is to get a black box warning on a drug? Prozac, for instance, for years was causing really severe, intense emotional 
outbursts and suicidal ideation and violence in young men particularly. And that took years to get a black box warning on. But some rats get some medullary carcinoma, thyroid, and we got a black box warning. And if you want to read the black box warning, just put in Wegovi into Google and it will pop right up on the main page. So you can read all about it there. What else? Oh, the pancreatitis. Uh, a lot of people keep wanting to come into my DMs. Oh, the pancreatitis. I looked it up and I looked it up on Medscape, which is the essentially the American Medical Association's website for doctors and the public, but it's usually you have to get behind a login wall. If you're a physician, have an account and it gives you all the latest updates and data around everything medical related. And it's 0.03 per 100 years of patient use. So that means a hundred people took it for a year and 0.03 developed pancreatitis. So I don't know if that's super common. Another lady dropped into my DMs and she's like, this is carcinogenic. Carcinogenic means cancer causing. Uh, no, we don't have any proof of that. If you have thyroid issues, of course, be cautious, right? And on that note, full disclaimer, I am not your doctor. I am no one's doctor at this point. I don't even see patients. I take the occasional patient a few times a year, and that's usually only by referral only. And I am not giving you any medical advice. I am educating you. I just am trying to dispel some rumors and fear. And I think some propagandized nonsense around these seemingly incredibly helpful peptides. What else did I want to share with you? Oh, side effects. The gastrointestinal side effects. Yes, they're real. And the nausea is real. And the diarrhea and the constipation and the vomiting can be real as well. I have some theories about this. After talking to some doctors in the functional medicine space, prescribing this, and just from what I know of practicing for over a decade, and from what I've seen in the literature, the paper I found showed basically in a nutshell, those who are lean have a certain microbiome in their guts. And those who are leaning more towards insulin resistance and type two diabetes have a different type of microbiome in, the, in, your, in their gut. So there's pro metabolic disease microbiota. And depending on how you eat and what really takes hold in your gut, your gut will shift. So we know that depending on how you eat, you can shift your microbiota in a matter of minutes to hours, depending on the meals that you're having. But if you're feeding your gut garbage and you are potentiating the lifespan of the pathologic microbiota or the not so favorable ones that lead more to an obesogenic insulin resistant state, that's a real thing happening in the world. And then this study showed when you add GLP-1 agonists, they work better, interestingly, on the healthy guts. They don't work as well. And there's not as much of a response on the more pathologic guts microbiota. So that's a really crude way of explaining that study, but you get what I'm saying. If you're already healthy, which I really doubled down on in, in part one of this, if you're really healthy already, this is, I think, a really phenomenal adjunct peptide if needed, right? And you've got to, of course, talk to your doctor and your healthcare pro professionals, make sure it's right for you. I'm not giving you a medical advice, but just from my clinical thinking, I would think that this would be a really ideal peptide intervention as part of a comprehensive toolkit. And there's probably some pre-work that needs to be done. There's probably a lot of gut cleanup. There's probably a lot of lifestyle modifications that need to be done prior to starting it. That's what I'm trying to get at. If I were in practice and I were prescribing today, I would not hand this out as a first line. Even if the person was morbidly obese, I would absolutely insist that some exercise is begun, some lifestyle changes are implemented, and obviously some dietary changes, because we want to shift the microbiota to a more favorable one very quickly. And we want to clean up some of this hot mess. So if you take someone that's a complete hot mess of health and you throw GLP-1 agonists on top, I think you could end up with a bigger mess. And so I went through a lot of videos on YouTube of people talking about the horrors. And to be honest, a lot of the stories sounded the same. I believe that these folks, and I'm not passing judgment here, but I would say by what I know clinically, my clinical experience, yes, I can tell a lot by looking at a person. I'm not judging. I can just tell a lot by looking at a person. I can usually kind of see their inflammatory state, their metabolic state, just by appearance alone. I've been at this a long time. And I would 
gander to say that these folks probably had a lot of pre-work to do before throwing GLP-1 agonists on top. Now that said, some folks are in such a terrible dire mess that GLP-1 agonists are potentially necessary up front because we've got to kickstart the system. We got to give them a leg up. You know, somebody who's extremely overweight, who's extremely in poor health and having a very difficult time and in a lot of pain and having trouble moving even, this might be a earlier intervention with the promise that they would be compliant with the other lifestyle recommendations we're making. That said, it is my personal and clinical experience that most people are not very compliant. And that is something I heard from a lot of these doctors is we're trying to get people to lift weights and be protein forward with their diet so that they don't lose muscle mass while they're on these peptides, but they're not doing it. And I can confirm that more often than not, people talk a lot of talk and they talk a lot and they plan a lot and they read a lot and they study a lot and they ingest a ton of information. The work has to be done. Otherwise you'll just waste away on these things and you'll end up in a more obesogenic state. And I explained that on the other podcast. We don't want, we don't want you to go on these waste away, lose a ton of muscle mass because you're not doing anything to maintain it. And then at the end of the day, you go off them, you gain all the weight back because you never changed anything about your lifestyle, your dietary changes, and you're just eating less garbage because these are dosed too high, in my opinion, too fast. And folks are basically getting their appetites completely knocked out. And so, you know, instead of eating a bag of Doritos, they're eating a few Doritos and that's it. And they're wasting away and they're losing a ton of muscle mass. And then they go off of them, their appetite returns, they go back to their bag a day of Doritos and everything else. And then they just gain a ton of fat and they've lost muscle. So now they're in the worse situation than they were when they started. That's the argument everybody's coming in with. And I think there's a lot of ignorance. I I could just tell by the comments on my posts this week on Instagram, the ignorance that people have. People are like, well, just eat less and exercise more. The brain in the obesogenic state and in the insulin resistant state is a bit busted. And yes, there is a lot that lifestyle modifications can do to overcome that. But there are some cases where that's just not possible. And they need a little bit of help to reset that switch. And I'm going to do a whole episode on the brain of the obesogenic and insulinogenic state. Cause I think that we're not giving these people credit. I think we're passing a lot of judgment. It's easy to say, you know, I'm, I'm lean. I've always been lean. It's easy for me to say, Oh, just exercise and eat better. But I know as somebody who practiced medicine for over a decade and ran a lot of labs and saw a lot of patients and helped a lot of patients lose weight without any of these peptides, actually, we did it differently back then, but these people sometimes need a reboot and I really love being a naturopathic physician, a licensed naturopathic physician in the state of Oregon, because I have full prescribing rights. And so I have been able to do the art of medicine really well, where we use pharmaceuticals as needed to give folks a leg up. And we bring in the lifestyle changes and the supplements and the nutraceuticals and all of that. And hopefully the good living starts to outweigh the drug need. And we can reduce that drug down to a minimal dosage or nothing at all. And oftentimes take it away. That's one of my biggest joys. And one of the reasons I became a licensed naturopathic physician is because I could indeed take people off drugs. If you're not licensed to prescribe them, you legally cannot take them off of them, but I could. And so I love getting people off of drugs they no longer needed because we had gotten their lifestyle and their health in such good working order and gotten homeostasis working. But Sometimes we need a little help there and I'm not a purist. I use whatever tools I can get my hands on to get people what they need. Everybody has a different timeline. Everybody's in a different state. Some people are in such horrendous misery and pain and discomfort and, you know, literally crawling up to hit bottom. And I do what I can to alleviate their pain with whatever modern tools I have. So we could argue that all day and I'm not interested in arguing. I know what I do well and I know how many people I've helped with that way of thinking. And that was the way my mentor taught me. And he was a brilliant man who was in practice for decades, helped a lot of people. I've helped a lot of people. And so I am not opposed at all to the use of these GLP-1 agonists. I think actually we may want to start them a lot earlier. I'll I'll give you a scenario. I'm going to share my own story. I, in 2019, I was the leanest, strongest, and most metabolically sound that I've ever been in my life. And I have struggled with PCOS in the past. I have struggled with being underweight. I've struggled with being a little overweight. And when you're younger, insulin resistance doesn't show itself on labs because your body's holding itself in homeostasis so well because of youth. 
it starts to creep up as you get older and it still doesn't show itself on labs for me. My labs still look remarkable and enviable, but I started to see signs and it was the whole pushing back against the narrative over the course of 2020, 2021, 2022. I took a lot of shrapnel, you guys. And if you're new to me, you have no idea, but I held the line with a big account, with a big audience. I held the line and I took a lot of heat and it took its toll. Stress will induce insulin resistance. Stress will induce a type two diabetic state. And I haven't talked about that yet. I really should do a podcast on that because and create a lot of content around it because I think it's really underappreciated how much stress can destroy your health. But I started to see glimmers and I'll share some, for instance, my mother was very metabolically unsound in her early forties due to some hip issues and some other health things. And I watched it happen. And this was before anybody had any respect for the term metabolic syndrome. They called it syndrome X, but I watched it take my mom's health from her for a long time. And so I immediately started lifting weights in my early forties, late, late, really late thirties, like early forties, got very serious about my fitness into my forties. I was doing really well. I was in my, I don't know, 46, I guess, 47 when COVID hit 47, I, it landed on our shores the month I turned 47, I think. And over the next couple years, I started to really feel perimenopause and I do all the things and I have access to all the things. I have all the biohacking resources. I have all the tools. I have all the tricks. I lead a very clean lifestyle. I have a very pristine diet. I lift weights regularly. I do all the things. And I started to get glimmers that my mother was having in her early 40s, only I was in my late 40s. So I at least, you know, kept it off for about 10 years. But I started to get low grade rosacea. And I started to have some adult acne show itself, which is kind of a combo with that. I started to, I had a terrible psoriasis flare in 2022. Terrible. It went into psoriatic arthritis, which is a body-wide condition, extremely painful and horrible. And I kept telling everybody something's wrong. Something's wrong. Well, nothing was showing up on labs. Labs looked perfect. My serum insulin was low. My blood sugar was low. Everything was great. And my hormones seemed reasonable. There was really nothing there. And I have spent the entirety of the last really year to year and a half crawling out of this mess that happened. So I started looking at GLP-1 agonists for pain and it was remarkable what I found. I started looking at them for brain inflammation and I was shocked. I started looking at them for rheumatoid arthritis and for psoriasis and lo and behold, remarkable results. So I fully intend on using these peptides and I'm going to share my journey with you guys, but that's not what we're talking about today. I'm just telling you the insulin resistance can be showing itself low. Oh, skin tags. I got a couple more skin tags on me, little tiny glimmers of insulin resistance showing itself in my body. And if I weren't a doctor and didn't know this, I weren't a functional medicine doctor, really a naturopathic physician, I wouldn't know this, but I was like, huh, why am I cellularly insulin resistant? And it didn't matter what I did. It didn't, there was no amount of sauna strength training, intermittent fasting. There was no amount of it that was really giving me the boot, the reboot that I needed to get out of it. And so that all that to say your labs could be perfect, but if you think something's wrong, I always listen to the patient. If a patient walks in and says something's wrong with me, I'm like, all right, let's, let's get on it until we either resolve your symptoms or we figure out what's wrong, but it's not my job to judge. And there's a lot of people out there struggling with five, 10 pounds. And you guys are saying, oh, well, it's vanity to use these for weight loss and blah, blah, blah. Well, it's lazy to use blood pressure medications when you just need to lose 40 pounds, right? I mean, we could say that. I'm not. I, if you need to use the blood pressure medication so you don't blow a gasket, then use them, but lose the 40 pounds too, right? We don't judge people for using pharmaceuticals. And I love to use pharmaceuticals intermittently as needed. And you bet I put people on high blood pressure meds when I need to, but it's temporary or it's intermittent. We're using it until we get everything else balanced out until we figure out why, why are things going awry? Why is homeostasis off? That's more important to me. Long story short, I don't understand why we're vilifying people for using a tool temporarily. I go into my ideas around cycling it, how I don't think you're supposed to be on super high doses, how I don't think you're supposed to be on it forever. I go over all of that in part one. For those of you asking about dosing, I can't give you specifics, but I can say this with all drugs, slow and low, 
slow and low, right? That Beastie Boy song, slow and low. That is the tempo. That's how I do all drugs, slow and low. I love to microdose pretty much anything that is needed. We use the lowest dose. I'm talking much lower starting dose than what even the literature is saying. I put people on tiny milligrams of things and I slowly build them up until we hit that sweet spot because I have found clinically and I've written a lot of prescriptions. I have found clinically that people need far lower doses than what the standard medical model is telling us. So in this case with semaglutide, you're supposed to start people at 0.25 milligrams. Well, I think if most people start there, they probably are going to have some pretty severe gastrointestinal symptoms and some side effects. And so I'm talking like 0.1, right? 0.1 milligram for that might be the dose forever. That's microdosing, right? And terzepatite is dosed differently, but I am a big fan of slow and low in all cases. So I'm going to leave it at that. I'll leave it up to you to find a practitioner to work with. Again, I don't see patients. I'm not taking patients. I can't help you guys with this, please. Uh, so many people have messaged me and asked me to take on their case and help them with dosing and really specific medical questions. I can't get into, I'm not your doctor. That's medical advice. And I am not going to touch it. So for the sake of simplicity and boundaries, I can't help you with this. I'm just educating you here and I have nothing to sell you. I'm not trying to acquire any patients. I am simply trying to put to rest this nonsense of uh, propagandized fear that's around this. So let's jump into this study. Novel insights into the roles and mechanisms of GLP-1. So check this out. GLP-1, so there's 170, what did I say? Four studies here and I found a whole bunch more. And this paper basically looks at the data and looks at GLP-1 agonist impact on a variety of conditions. Now there's several different GLP-1 agonists, more than just semaglutide and terzepatide. There's a variety of these that have been in use for a long time. And this data is looking at their use on, so different peptides on different conditions. We've got osteoporosis, we've got Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, vascular aging, atherosclerosis, hypertension, kidney diseases, osteoarthritis, which was very interesting to me, sarcopenia. They didn't go too much into a lot of the brain stuff, but I have studied the brain impacts of this extensively. It regenerates neurons, you guys. It regrows heart tissue. I think this might put the pharmaceutical industry out of business. So here's in the abstract. Aging and age-related diseases have emerged as increasingly severe health and social problems. Therefore, it is imperative to discover novel and effective therapeutics to delay the aging process and to manage aging-related diseases. Glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists, one of the class of anti-hyperglycemic drugs, have been recommended to manage type 2 diabetes. Moreover, GLP-1 RAs have been shown to protect against oxidative stress, cellular senescence, and chronic inflammation, which are widely accepted as the major risk factors of aging. However, their significance in aging or age-related diseases has not been elucidated. Herein, we explain the underlying mechanisms and protective roles of GLP-1 RAs in aging from a molecular, cellular, and phenotypic perspective. We provide novel insights into the broad prospect of GLP-1 RAs in preventing and treating age-related diseases. Additionally, we highlight the gaps for further studies in clinical applications in age-relating diseases. This review forms a basis for further studies on a relationship between age-relating diseases and GLP-1 RAs. They go so far as to suggest that these peptides may do away with polypharmacy. Polypharmacy is where a person is on several medications and most 50 year olds and older are on like five plus medications in this country, each one. So yeah, that's a pretty bold statement. And removing polypharmacy would put the pharmaceutical industry out of business because remember diabetes is very profitable for them. Besides their strong hypoglycemic effects, GLP-1 RAs can significantly reduce the risk of hyper, hypoglycemia, or it should say hyperglycemia. It can lower lipid levels, maintain blood pressure, and enhance cardiovascular protection and re renal protection, which is kidneys. Therefore, GLP-1 RAs can be used to reduce polypharmacy in older adults, especially those with multimorbidity. It's a very bold statement. A recent study showed that GLP-1 RAs might protect against chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and cellular senescence. That's where your cells go to sleep and quit working, all of which are the major risk factors of aging. 
Furthermore, various clinical trials have demonstrated that GLP-1 RAs play important roles in delaying and treating age-related diseases. Now, a lot of the studies that they go over here in detail are on mice and rats, but there's many human ones as well. And so I will quickly share with you some of the really shocking information I found. They are neuroprotective. They repair DNA in neurodegenerative diseases. Lauric glutide can ameliorate mitochondrial dysfunction via the cyclic AMP pathway and can correct mitochondrial energy crisis. Mitochondrial energy crisis is really the root cause of what's wrong with everybody in this world at this point. We have poisoned our mitochondria into oblivion and we don't have any muscle. And so we therefore don't have a lot of mitochondria. The mitochondrial impact alone is enough to get me excited. There are pathways that are genetic that are being protected just in a nutshell. They are protective against the liver and fatty liver. If you guys haven't listened to my fatty liver episode, I think that's episode 105. Go back and listen to that. Hepatocyte steatosis, that is fatty liver. It can also be inhibited by GLP-1 through inducing the response of unfolded protein. It protects proteins that misfold. This is at the root of aging is proteins that misfold. And I mean, that's like bio 101 and they can protect proteins. I think it's just nuts. So anti-aging effects, various impacts on various age-related diseases, including metabolic, neurodegenerative, cardiovascular, kidney, and degenerative musculoskeletal diseases. So my background, if you guys don't know, is I did a lot of regenerative injection therapies and I mainly did musculoskeletal medicine and pain. And dealt with a lot of bioidentical hormone replacement. And my goal always is to regenerate joints. I've done several episodes about pain and orthopedics. You guys can go back and listen to those. We'll put them in the show notes. But basically osteoarthritis and osteoporosis are metabolic at their core. They're diabetes of the joint and diabetes of the bone. And so anything that can shift that is money, in my opinion, is really worth looking at. GLP-1 can reverse the age-associated impairment of insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance. So in my last episode, I really made an argument for decreasing fat cell size and how that was reversing diabetes and insulin resistance. But what I did not get into in too much detail was GLP-1s actually have a direct impact on different organ systems of the body, on the brain, and on the signaling pathways that turn these impairments around as well. So we have direct impacts on insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance. So it's not just the fat cells decreasing. And I should have covered that in the last one, but I had a lot to go over and I didn't get into it. GLP-1 stimulates pancreatic cell proliferation and differentiation, thus improving pancreatic beta cell function in elderly rodents. That's your type one diabetics guys. That's really compelling information. It browns white fat. So when you see people cold plunging, they're trying to brown their white fat. Your brown fat helps you stay metabolically active and it helps you stay lean. And when fat goes from brown to white, it turns in white fat is that sort of pro-inflammatory old person's fat, right? And so young babies and kids have a lot of brown fat and older folks have white fat and we start to pack it on. So this actually browns white fat back to brown. Pretty damn cool. A lot of information in the study about the elderly and those over age 65, which I think is, you know, it's really tragic when you see vital folks go downhill and some folks are doing everything they can to stay vital, but they would come into my office. They'd be lean. They'd be fit. They'd still have diabetes creeping on. You've heard me talk about this before. If you live long enough, you will end up insulin resistant. And that's just how the aging process goes. It's called inflammaging. And it's a real bummer because these folks are doing everything right. They're riddled with pain. They start to get pre-diabetic or diabetic. They're active, but, and they've done everything right up until now, but just the simplicity of the aging process is catching up to them. And we end up with problems and they have a lot of pain often. So it's hard for them to be as active, but they fight through it because they're heroes. But if we could ameliorate that, this is, I mean, talk about anti-aging. GLP-1 receptor agonists have a lower risk of diabetic ketoacidosis, lower limb amputations, and genital infections. Okay, so here's a cool little depiction that's inside the study that shows all the different 
organ systems that are impacted. So I'm going to go over that quickly. Psychological diseases, beneficial effects on mood disorders, possible adjunctive treatment for depression. As far as atherosclerosis goes, which is placking of the arteries and vascular disease, we've got reduced blood lipid and CIMT. As far as fatty liver goes, we've got it alleviates hepatic inflammation, metabolic dysfunction, insulin resistance, and lipotoxicity. As far as obesity is concerned, there's weight loss. As far as vascular aging, may delay vascular aging and induce neovascularization. It regrows vascular trees. It literally regrows your vascular supply into your bones. The impact on the bones and the joints are profound. I'm super stoked. I'm going to have to save that for another podcast. Osteoarthritis, potential to attenuate joint pain and arthritis. That would be huge. That right there alone, any of you listening with joint pain knows what a complete bummer that is. As someone who treated joint pain forever and ever, I used regenerative injections, prolotherapy, PRP stem cells, and eventually that stuff comes back and we have to repeat the treatment. It's rarely a one-shot wonder. It can be very expensive. These are not so expensive. And I'm most interested in the usage of these for cognition, mood improvement, and pain right? If those three things, that's in my opinion, how a lot of problems start is folks start sort of winding down cognition wise, they end up in a lot of pain and they stop moving. And once that happens, the insulin resistance takes full hold. As far as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease goes, data has shown improvement in motor and cognitive functions. There is nothing out there that treats Alzheimer's disease well or Parkinson's for that matter. So I can see why maybe the, far, you know, big pharma is vilifying these peptides because they want their drugs to sell. They don't want something as simple as a compounded peptide to sell. Hypertension, it lowers blood pressure, kidney diseases, renal outcome improvements, type two diabetes, better glycemic control, benefits on diabetes related complications. As far as osteoporosis goes, no association with decreased BMD and increased risk of fractures. So what they did in that study is they looked at bone metabolic disease and they looked at wrist fracture to make sure that putting folks on these medications or peptides didn't make their bone health worse. And it did not. It actually had a positive impact and positive effects on bone metabolism. And as far as sarcopenia goes, which is muscle wasting, which you know is my jam, you guys, I love anything that protects and promotes muscle health. This does it. These This class of peptides does that as well. Um, improvement in gastrointestinal uh, function. It actually helps regrow and improve the leaky gut syndrome. So yes, there's GI issues, but there's also healing of the tissues. So let me get back to, I kind of skipped over what I was trying to say earlier on in the episode. Those coming in with really bad dysbiosis in their guts. So they've got really bad leaky gut. They've got a really bad microbiota in there because they're eating garbage. They're eating junk food. They're eating the standard American diet. They're drinking sodas. They have a lot of stress. They might be obese. They might be, you know, just your standard American diet type person, your standard American really might have some cleanup to do because I think that they might be experiencing, yes, the drug itself can slow gastric emptying and cause some GI issues, but I think they might also be de dealing with what we call a die-off reaction or a Herxheimer reaction. When you shift the microbiota quickly or when things start to go in one direction, usually when I'm putting patients through like a gut cleanse or we're trying to clear out the flora while we heal the gut, uh, the pathologic flora, as those bugs die off, they release all kinds of nasty stuff, lipopolysaccharides, endotoxins, exotoxins, and that makes the person feel so, so sick. And it can cause a lot of GI issues. It can cause a lot of headache. It can cause a lot of just feeling like you have the flu and we call it a Herxheimer reaction. And so let's take fungus, for instance, when I find candida or fungus in the gut and I clear it out on a patient, they'll often call and say, I mean, we warn them and we give them a handout that warns them, but they'll often call and say, God, I feel like I have the flu. I have the worst headache of my life. What's going on? And we're like, just hang in there, sauna, take binders, get yourself through it. And I think that's happening when we apply these peptides to people in some cases, I think they might be having such a shift in their gut health overall, that what they're experiencing as a die-off reaction is being confused with the drug inducing the problem, 
right? As a side, they, they're considering it a side effect of the drug, but it might just be a die off reaction. That's just my theory. I don't have anything to prove that, but based on what I know from treating thousands of patients and helping thousands of patients with their gut health, what I'm hearing from folks who've had a bad time in the initial stages, really profoundly bad times in some cases, it sounds a lot like a die off reaction to me. And it can actually exacerbate if you have underlying Crohn's or any kind of inflammatory bowel disease, IBS, but in the long term, it's healing the gut. There's data showing it improving significantly Crohn's and ulcerative colitis in folks and healing up the gut. And a lot of people have reported that their IBS has gone away. So take that for what you will. I'm most interested in how it is impacting rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory diseases of the joints. And I'm going to commit to a whole podcast on that because while there's not a ton of data, what I have found is worth doubling down on and digging into. So there you have it. There is a whole lot more here that I can go through. A lot of this that I starred and underlined and highlighted was about musculoskeletal conditions because that's my jam. And so I will come back and do a whole episode on muscle, bone, joints, all that jazz, the brain, what it's got to do with it. And we'll talk about that more deeply. But I think that this really sums it up when we understand that potentially applying these peptides done correctly might reduce polypharmacy and therein might be the problem that big pharma has with it and why they are really crapping all over it and propaganda kidizing and vilifying it. So I will leave you with that, guys. I hope this is helpful. I'll make sure that I, the link to this study is in the show notes. Again, it's novel insights into the roles and mechanisms of GLP-1 receptor agonists against aging related diseases. I think what's so exciting about this is that most of the studies that I found over the past many months are all contained herein. So you guys can get one big summary. And yeah, it's a little sciencey, but I think that most people can understand it if you take the time. It's many pages long, but this is really it. Like if you want to double down and understand the science behind how these work, this is your paper. And I was pretty stoked when I found it and I'm glad to share it with you today. If you guys have any questions for upcoming episodes, hit me up at podcast at drtina.com. If you want to add to the conversation, around GLP-1 agonists. If you have personal experience that you want me to know about, email us. If you have other questions that I haven't touched on yet, email us because I plan on doing more in this series. I'm pretty geeked out on this right now and I think it might save the world. I know that's a really bold statement, but what I'm finding is lining up. So, so much thanks. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe. If you are watching us on YouTube, please subscribe on YouTube. I am trying to grow that account so I can reach more people and we're trying to really up our game on the video. So I appreciate you guys being tolerant with me. I hope you like, again, like my sign and we're working on lighting and cameras and it's all been a lot of fun. My daughter is the one actually helping me. So this is a homegrown experiment. <laughs> so we are, we're doing the best we can and we really appreciate you guys. So I will be back next week. 